Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. Thanks for hanging with me today. Um, I'm going to be in Psalm 23, which is obviously an amazing psalm. I hope hope you guys are doing well. Um, I, I don't know if, uh, well, I, my question was, how are we all doing? Um, you know, I felt after Sunday, I was pretty challenged and, and I found myself <clears throat> wrestling with my own heart, my own, my own um, issues. And I thought, man, this is great. I've got, I've got this junk off my chest. I'm excited about what's happening. And, um, and then I hit last night and I'm, I'm sitting there getting ready to go to bed and I've got my phone in my hand. And I thought, man, I'd, I wouldn't mind taking this thing home in, in to my, into my bedroom. I was going to, you know, I can finish up a little bit of reading and, uh, finish playing one of the games that I like to play, uh, solitaire and gin rummy, which I know it, probably not, you know, the world's worst games. Um, but I, uh, I was sitting there and I, I was actually in the process I wrestled with, well, what does it really matter? You know, and, and, and in that moment, the, the, the process of the fact that I had sat and, and confessed to you and to our, our church body that I wasn't going to do any of that stuff that I was going to put it down, um, became a short wrestling match. And then I went and set it down and went to bed. And one of those unique nights where, like my mind just wouldn't shut off. So I laid in bed probably for an hour or more um, talking to the Lord and then drifting off of that and realizing I was still awake and talking to the Lord some more and drift back and forth. And I just had a wonderful evening of interacting with God and um, just not having the phone there, not not looking at a screen, but talking to the Lord. So it was pretty awesome. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks again for joining us. It's good to have you here. Um, I am grateful for the opportunity uh, that we have to interact and and to do this stuff. I'm um, like I shared with you before. I'm still wrestling with the time frame and how often to do this. Um, trying to balance out my own uh, busyness, my own schedule, and and take care of the things that we need to take care of. And so I'm still praying through kind of what that pattern is going to be. Um, and, and I'm not hundred percent sure yet what it is. So, uh, as, as we move forward, um, we'll, we'll figure that out as we go. So anyway, good to have you and let's, um, jump into the text this morning. Um, it's one of my favorite texts, uh, actually I keep saying that, but I think they're all my favorite texts. Just been really in, enjoying this time of going through the Psalms together with you. Um, oh, I did have another question. And that question is, what's your plan for when this is done? Um, because there will be a point at which I'm not going to be online with you every morning. Um, actually, that's starting right now because I'm we're cutting back that schedule a little bit. But what's your plan for when this is done? Um, if you have, like I have, if you have found this to be meaningful and uh, challenging to be in the Word, to, to make this time, to, to, to actually commit to being in, in this um, in, in a, a 20 or 30 minute devotion on a fairly regular basis. Some of you may already have that pattern. Some of us I know don't. Um, uh, what, what's your plan for when we're done? Um, because the, the reality is we all need to be feeding. We all need to be engaged in the word and, and, and growing and, and challenging ourselves in the word um, through the power of the Holy Spirit and, and by being present and by being engaged. So um, I want to really challenge you today to think about what your what your plan is when this ends, when life kind of starts going back to normal. And I'm noticing that it is. Uh, uh, we're seeing on Facebook, we're seeing our numbers of those who are participating, those who, you know, who the it's reaching the news feeds. And I don't know if, if Facebook can change that or if they, you know, if they can actually limit who how much the news feeds go out. Um, but in the early days, when we first started doing this live stream, we were hitting, uh, you know, 800 to 1,000, sometimes 1,700 uh, people were being reached. Um and that's that's scaled back quite a bit now, um, down into the just a couple hundred, and which is totally awesome. I, I'm not worried about the numbers, but what what I'm what I think I'm reading in that is that people are beginning to kind of find a normal again, kind of find their pattern of life, and for whatever reason, it doesn't include um, as much of what we're doing here and and where we're trying to meet around the Word of God. Um, as what it did when this whole goofy uh, experiment first started of, of having people stay at home. And so 
one of the things that I want to challenge us is as we go back, as we establish whatever our life patterns are, to not miss the opportunity to put the word of God into that life pattern, to make it a priority. Whatever we care about is the, are the things that we'll make time for. And the reality of that statement is proven and displayed by when, if we look at our day and we find out how often we're in prayer, how much time do we spend listening to the Lord? How much time do we spend in the word um, wrestling with what he's saying and what, how it, or how it affects our lives, how it impacts um, how we live. So let's jump into Psalm 23 this morning and we will get started. Um, Let's, let's begin Psalm 23 verse one. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. Your cup overflows. Excuse me fact that my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. One of the amazing things in that text is that David recognizes God as a shepherd, and David was very familiar with shepherding. He understood the principles of shepherding and how it worked in that particular time, in that uh, geographic area, the challenges that were there, the risks we see in David's life. He talk about killing bears and lions, and, and and all of those the things that come with shepherding, and and we're really distract we're distant from shepherding because we don't do it in in a hands-on model where the shepherd would live in the field with the sheep and would 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 protect them and would do all the things that come with that particular aspect of shepherding. Um, we're going to look at a little bit in the New Testament of shepherding because Jesus himself references this beautiful picture. But first, let's look at what David's talking about in Psalm 23, or at least how, you know, what, what I'm wrestling with or what I'm seeing him challenge us to consider who the Lord is. He said, the first thing he says is the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lay down, lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Now, depending on when David wrote this, this could be a, a particular time in his life where he's actually experiencing this peace and this quietness and this, this provision from God. But so much of David's life is kingdom was in battle and in conflict with the Philistines and 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 either running from Saul or dealing with his sons going haywire. When you read first and second Samuel, it just seems like there's there's this there's this constant tension and movement in Israel, in the nation of Israel, as God is allowing them to have a king and and uh, dealing with their with their disobedience and with their rebellious heart and all of the stuff that comes with that. And here David is calling God the Lord, his shepherd, and he references how in with the shepherd, with this shepherd that's watching over him, he won't be in need of anything. He'll 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 be able to lie down in, in good pasture, green pasture where there's plenty of provision, by still water where where it's easy for sheep to get to get to the drink, um, restores my soul. He says, he leads me in a path of righteousness for his name. He, he is acknowledging this amazing provisional God who's protecting him, who's guiding him, who's providing for him, who's doing all the things that he needs to be a healthy, productive sheep, if you will, using that illustration as God is the shepherd and we are the sheep. David is identifying this reality of who God is to him. And that picture, that particular reality, then impacts how he sees his time in the valley of the shadow of death. And I was thinking about this earlier. Um, sometimes we talk about the valley of the shadow of death, and and it's we, we talk about it as if it's a life moment, like when somebody is close to death or when they're experiencing sickness or illness, they're in the valley of the shadow of death. But I believe the reality of this, the picture of this, is that while we're here on this earth, once we are born, once we're in Uh, in the earth, especially in its current condition where it's um, impacted by sin and, and, and Satan is, is roaming around to, to destroy and kill and, and deceive people that, that we're constantly in that valley of the shadow of death. We're, we're, we're on this earth. We are always in that process. We're always in that, in that moment where, um, 
our physical lives outside of God's, I mean, obviously we're inside of God's control, but in that moment, there's, there's always the, the coming threat of the physical death, the, the, the potential for that. And so it's in, it's in this life. It's in that moment that David says, I will fear no evil for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So David here, David, I believe is looking at the, the, the reality of life, the, 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 the significance of the earthly living dwelling place that we have, the, the rampant movement of evil in the midst of all of that stuff. And he says, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. And that's one of the beautiful pictures of this shepherd is that he's with them. He's not leaving them. Um, he's providing for them. And, and, and then we see in verse five, he says, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. David is acknowledging again, this provision of God, this protection of God that in the midst of, during, I mean, in the presence of his enemies, when things are, are, are even not well, God is still providing for him the sustenance, the care that he needs, and, and, and all of those things. And then he, in verse 6, he references, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We would not probably define everything that we watched in David's life be goodness and mercy. We just, I mean, if I were to look at it and say, some of that did not look good. Some of it did not look like it was really, really wonderful or or something that we would choose to do or participate in. But David recognizes that because the Lord is his shepherd, because he's the provider, he's the one that's caring for him. He's the one protecting him. He's the one doing all of the things that he needs and and. and that God is good and that God is merciful, that his mercy and his goodness will follow him all the days of his life. And I love how he ends this particular Psalm because he ref, I think he references the most beautiful aspect of our relationship with God. And what we're going to see in Jesus's comments or uh, coming up in just a minute about being the shepherd <clears throat> is that we, that David says, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The beauty, the the wonder, the, the, the most amazing aspect of what we have is that God has invited us into his presence. That we, as a flawed, broken creation, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, are invited into a relationship with the creator God of the universe. That should overwhelm our hearts. That, that should transform how we think. It should even affect how we can how we look at what it means to be, to follow the, the commands of the Lord. We talked about it yesterday. If you love me, you will obey me. Jesus says that to his disciples. And it's the reality of what comes in a relationship with God when we love him. It's it's the outflow of, of that truth. And Jesus calls actually addresses this whole shepherd issue in John chapter 10. Truly, truly, uh, verse 1. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of the stranger. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying. He, here the disciples are not getting it, right? He's talking about sheep and shepherds in the fold and, and how there's just people that are thieves and are trying to come in and steal, but the good shepherd, the real shepherd, uh, the sheep know his name, they'll follow him, they, they, all of this stuff is happening. And the disciples don't get it. So Jesus, in verse 7, Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. For as the father knows me and I know the father, I lay down my life for the sheep. 
And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life and that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my father. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, he has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, no, these are not the words of one who is uh, uh, oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Jesus is baffling uh, the, his followers again. He's, he's describing and talking about him as the good shepherd and how he's laying down his life. And there's, there's another, there's other sheep that aren't in that fold right there. And I, I, that's, you know, I believe he's talking about the, the Gentiles who are going to come later on. But right now he's, he's addressing the Jews and he's, he's giving this beautiful picture of a, sh of a sheep fold and how Jesus is the door. He's the gateway in, and he's the good shepherd, um, which is more than just, more than just a, a, a simple shepherd. He's the good shepherd, the one that's going to do this well, protect the sheep that's, that's good. And all of these things are true about who Jesus is. And he's baffling the, those who are standing there. And, and I can only imagine the disciples are struggling with that whole picture going, wait, are you calling us sheep? How, wait, how is this working? But when we think about who Jesus is and we think about knowing his voice and being one with him, understanding who it is, when we go back to Psalm 23, we actually see David professing and, and, and declaring who God is. Even though sometimes in his life, we, we may look at what he, he's gone through and say, man, it, was God really there? Was he really good? Did he really do all of those amazing things that we see in Psalm 23? But David knows the Lord. And even in the midst of those difficult things, he he expressed his knowledge, his love, his his affirmation of who the Lord is as a shepherd that he can trust and the one that he will dwell with for all of his days forever. And Jesus here in John is saying, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the one that you've been waiting for. I'm the one that's going to open the door to be in the sheepfold with God. I am I am the good shepherd. And so it's this beautiful picture of Jesus becoming the way, laying down his life willingly, laying down, making a way for those of us who are lost to come in and be part of that fold. So the question that I'm always wrestling with in, in this process is, do I know his voice? Do I know Jesus? Do, do I have that intimate relationship with him so that when I'm reading scripture, when I'm praying that I hear from him? Honestly, I think that's one of the things that I was probably found myself struggling with this last week is as I was doing all of the Bible study and I was preparing sermons and 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 wrestling with all this stuff and, and the still feeling dry and feeling empty. Part of what I realized last night as I was laying in bed and I was praying and, and talking to the Lord is that we hadn't had that conversation for a while. I'd been running around preparing lessons and, and pulling out Bible studies and, and dissecting sentences and looking at what the Greek word was and, and using my concordance and doing all this stuff that's really, really helpful for me in my study, really helpful for me in preparing um, the discussions around the word of God. But I hadn't just gotten quiet and prayed. I hadn't actually taken time to just listen and, and, and find out what God was doing. And, and to hear from him. Sometimes I get distracted by the numbers. I, I know that seems odd, but I do. It, it's very easy for me to get distracted by numbers. Um, in fact, it's one of the things that drives me nuts about using Facebook. I can see it up in the corner there, you know, how many people are watching and people come and go and, and, and in the midst of this, and, and it's, it's a goofy thing. It actually, at times can be a distraction with those numbers changing all the time. But what's the point? What, what's the point of, of this whole thing that we're doing? If it's not to be in an intimate relationship with God through Jesus Christ, through the shed blood of his son, then what are we doing it for? I mean, are, are we getting brownie points for this stuff? Do we get, do we get stars because we've read the Bible? Do we get, do we get, you know, jewels in heaven because we've gone to church enough times? I, I really don't think that's the point. Um, when, when Jesus says in Matthew 7, depart from me, I never knew you. 
He's referencing people who claimed to be followers of Christ, who, who, who performed miracles and prophesied and cast out demons in his name. These are people that professed to be doing his work. And he said, depart from me. I never knew you. And yet what we see in the Psalms, what we see from David is that he knew God. We watch him get frustrated and discouraged and, 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 and dive into despair at times and then resurface with, with confidence in who God is and how he's going to provide for him, how he's going to care for him. We see Jesus who, who talks about this idea in John 10, 10 that he's, he's the good shepherd and he is, is one God, actually one with the Father. And shortly after that, he goes into, in, in John, he actually starts describing this, how he and God are one and he wants us to be part of that. This is more than just putting on a show. It's more than just performing a service. It's more than just be professing to be Christians or to be followers of God. This is about knowing the shepherd's voice, being so connected with God that when we see our sin, it breaks our heart. When we realize that we're not close to him, we actually drop what we're doing and we turn and we we pursue that intimacy, that, that relationship with him again. What does that look like? I got to tell you, you guys, there's times where I hear people talk about intimacy with the Lord and, and we even sing some of the songs that we sing in church are so mushy. They should be love songs. They should be like on secular radio, not, not, not singing them to God. That's me personally. I, I don't, I don't think about gazing into the eyes of Jesus or, 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 you know, or kissing, kissing his hands or feet or in, any of that weird sappy stuff. That's just, I mean, that's not me. I just don't, I don't relate that way. And yet there's an intimacy and a knowledge that comes when you know somebody that you can trust them, that you're confident that regardless of what you're doing, regardless of what happens, you know that they love you and that they're going to be there with you, that they're going to they're going to be there for the best for you. And I believe that that's the idea here is we see Jesus referring to himself as the good shepherd. He's, he is somebody that we can trust who protects and guides and provides and does what's best for us. And so because of that, we can confidently come before the throne. We can, we can pursue him. We can, we can trust that what he's doing is our best and, and, and we can live dependent lives on him. What does it look like for you and for me to do that? You know, for me, one of the things that has to come out of this is a time of quiet prayer and, and reflection where I'm not, I'm not busy looking at phones or emails or taking phone calls or being on, on TV, watching shows or playing video games or, or whatever it is. It, it, it requires quiet reflection. Something I'm not very good at. I actually don't even like it. Normally, when it gets too quiet, I'll turn the radio up. In fact, just right before you guys got on here with me, I had my radio playing in the background just because I have a hard time with quiet. And yet it was a particularly needed time for me last night as I was seeking the Lord and just and trying to find that peace, trying to trying to to get my heart around what it means to quietly hear from the Lord and to seek him. So as you think about Jesus being your good shepherd this week, as you think about knowing him and knowing his voice, I want to encourage you to, to find time to be alone with the Lord, even today, to open your open his word, to pursue him, and and to seek his face. To, what, and what does that mean? I, I, you know, I don't even know what that means particularly um, in, in, in your own, in your own world. When I, when I say that, it means to, to, to be, to have an audience with him, to be face to face with him. Like, like what you and I would be, if we were sitting in this room, I'd be looking at you in the eyes, we'd be talking and, and we'd have eye to eye contact so we could communicate what, what we're feeling, what we're thinking more than just what we're saying. So what does that mean for you and for me as we engage in this process, as we consider pursuing a relationship with the Lord, knowing the good shepherd, knowing his voice, being united with him in such a way 
that we're at peace. We're by the still waters. We're, we're, we're in green pastures that, that even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we could, we'll fear no evil. We, we will completely and confidently trust him with all things that we're experiencing in this life. What does that mean for you and me? I think I know what God's asking me to work on. I want to challenge you to pray and ask God what he would have you to work on. Because as we pursue this together, as we seek him together, I believe he wants us to know him. And so I, as we uh, uh, turn our eyes, turn our, turn our attention, our focus on him, he will respond. And we, like David, will experience and, and, and grow in our depth of knowledge and understanding of who God is. And by his grace, we'll learn to know his voice and to respond. I hope you guys are having a, a, a blessed week uh, and, and, and um, month as, as we enter into, this, uh, into May. And um, Governor Inslee has extended the stay-at-home stuff. And I know all of us land in different places on that. You guys, I get it. Um, I, I have my own personal opinions and, um, you know, there's all kinds of stuff going. And I'm, Don and I were talking about that this morning. Don Anderson and I were talking about we're praying for his salvation for one thing. But we're also praying that God God gets leadership in this in, in the state of Washington that would honor him and that would be that would be concerned about the things that are important to God. And whether that happens or not, we're going to trust that God's in control and he's directing this path. And we as the church really need to be on our knees praying about this stuff, not 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 on Facebook griping about it um, or, or, or doing whatever we do, getting angry about this stuff. I know it makes me angry at times. I get all frustrated, but we need to be in prayer. We need to be in prayer like we've never been before. Every day there are people going to a Christless eternity. And, and if we understand the heart of God, if we understand that that he sent his son to die for the world, he loved the world so much that he sent his only son, John 3, 16. That's his heart and his passion. It should be our heart and our passion. I know we'll all express it differently. Not, I mean, I'm not a Jerry Larson. I won't ever be a Jerry Larson. God only made one of him. And, and, and I love my brother, and he has such a passion for the word and a passion for the gospel. I won't do it that way, and you don't have to do it that way. But however God's wired us and designed us, as we get to know him, as we, get to, as we become more and more in tune with his voice, we will know how he wants us to respond. But it seems very clear that we're to be praying and, and, and passionately seeking God's will and his direction and how we would be responding, how we would engage. And so that's my prayer for you this week, that as you seek the Lord this week, you will hear from him and he will direct you in an area of your life, whether it's an area of sin that you need to confess or it's an area of, of obedience that you need to exercise, or maybe it's even. Maybe it's even a, a, a neighbor or a, a lost soul that you run into that needs to hear the gospel from a loving, caring believer who, in the midst of all of these things, can offer hope, grace, and mercy, and good, the goodness of God when there seems to be so little present in the things that we're experiencing. May God bless you today as you pursue him and seek him and chase the text Get into your word, study this, use the cross references, go and find what God has for you today. I'll talk to you guys later. Have a great, great rest of your afternoon.